It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Last year, there was a headline from North Bay that read like a plot of Law and Order S SVU. And the, and the headline was, North Bay Mother Awakes to Nightmare of a Stranger Attacking Child. The attacker was charged with many crimes, but among them were two, cr two counts a breach of a conditional sentence order. Member Mr. For Speaker, Prescott Russell. that was one year ago uh, and a month, and what has this government done? They've done nothing to watch over violent criminals on probation and conditional sentences. It's unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, in the last year, how many other children have been harmed by violent offenders? How long are we going to wait until the government will make sure the criminals are checked? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that uh, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services will want to uh, comment on this. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, obviously, we all have to take uh, uh, these situations very, very seriously. Uh, our government takes uh, the safety of our communities extremely seriously, Mr. Speaker. And we work in partnership with our uh, police services and justice partners uh, to make Ontario one of the safest jurisdictions in North America, Mr. Speaker. And, of course, not not uh, in any way diminishing the, uh, the incident that the member opposite has, uh, has uh, identified, but for 11 straight years, Mr. Speaker, Ontario has had the lowest crime rate of any province or territory in Canada. Um, we're also, Ontario is also home to six of the 10 safest census, census metropolitan yes, areas in the country, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work with our police services, with our police partners, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. to make sure the right policies are in place. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Another story out of North Bay read, I quote, One woman and two men were arrested following a report of a stabbing Friday night that sent one person to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Following a verbal dispute with the man, one of the vis visitors was stabbed with a knife. One man was charged with assault with a weapon, aggravated assault, and breach of probation. The last charge, breach of probation. Clearly, he was a violent criminal. Did this individual receive any home visits? Of course not. He's expected under this system that the Liberals support to self-report. Like, Mr. Speaker, give me a break. You've got a violent offender who's expected to self-report if he feels tempted to stab someone. How can the government allow this to continue? Thank you. Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'll, uh, I guess I'll thank the member, the leader of the opposition, for his question, because it's actually great that I have to share with you, Mr. Speaker, and all Ontarians, that Ontario is one of the safest jurisdictions in North America, and I'm very proud that our crime rate has been decreasing for years, and offenders have been less likely actually to re-offend, Mr. Speaker. And when you talk about what we are doing as a government here in the province. You know, we are moving forward on a correctional reforms, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Sapers is... If some people can't read, I have not started in a fun note. Finish, please. Um, I'm very proud that we are working on our correctional transformation, and I always Answer. like to share and thank all our correctional officers, our parole and parole officer, probation officer, thank who you. works extraordinarily in our community. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, what you just heard is government talking points. The question was on how can we accept when there's violent criminals, sexual predators, how we think it's good enough to simply allow self-reporting and not having home visits. The minister praised the probation officers. Well, they're the ones who are whistleblowing on this government, saying it's not good enough. 4,513 convicted criminals of serious crimes out there, and we're expecting them to self-report. You know, how many examples do I have to give? Last week it was the case of child luring in Durham. Then it's the case in North Bay of a stabbing. How many serious criminal charges are there going to be where you have criminals out in our communities and they think self-reporting is good enough? A very clear question to the minister. Do you think self-reporting is fair and adequate minister for convicted housing. Sex predators Question. and violent criminals, yes or no? 
seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm going to say that the leader of of the opposition, and I would say his party, uh, you know, they talk a big talk, and you know, but their record shows otherwise. And I want to remind everyone about, especially the party leader, uh, track. The member from Nipissing come to order. The member from uh, Niagara West Glanbrook come to order. Carry on. Um, I want to talk about. Our leaders, uh, the party opposite leader, on his track record, Mr. Speaker, he's cut Canada's correctional service budget by 10 percent. And for those that don't know how much, it's $295 million, Mr. Speaker. He's also introduced ridiculous changes uh, to our mandatory minimum. And let's not forget cutting a word winning program to help uh, our offenders in terms of reintegrating and releasing. So, Mr. Speaker. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. You have a wrap-up sentence. Well, instead of playing politics with safety, we on this side of the house are committed, actually, to working with Thank our you. partner, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the premier. It seems yesterday the Liberals launched a new ad campaign about their budget. Mr. Speaker, how much more money will the Liberals be spending on these clearly partisan budget? advertisements. Can you tell us a number? Ontarians deserve to know how much of their money this government's using to sell their tired old lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, I have to say that uh, on this side of the House, we are very happy that uh, the budget that we have brought forward has been passed in this yeah. legislature, Mr. Speaker, and will now be implemented across the province. Um, obviously, the, uh, the member opposite uh, is not happy about that. He voted against uh, OHIP Plus, so that four million people in uh, four million children, Mr. Speaker, four million children and young people uh, will have access to free medication starting January 1st, 2018. He voted against that, Mr. Speaker, so he is not supportive. But we believe that that is a very good and important thing for young people and families in this province, Mr. Speaker. And he, he also doesn't want us to implement uh, free tuition for young people in the province, Mr. Speaker. He doesn't want Answer. to see $16 billion invested in new schools in places like Ottawa, Waterloo, Thunder Bay, across the Thank province, you. Mr. Speaker. We think those are important investments. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the question was on partisan government advertising, and I can see why the Premier doesn't want to answer, because they're embarrassed of how much they're abusing taxpayers. From Wawa to Petawawa, from Owen Sound to Perry Sound, this government is wasting taxpayer money on partisan vanity ads. And they, they applaud, they clap when they hear about how much money they're wasting. But I can tell you, Ontarians are not applauding, because it's unacceptable. It's unethical. Stop the clock, please. Chief Governor Whip, come to order. Minister of Children and Youth Services, come to order. Minister of Education, come to order. Please finish your question. Mr. Speaker, it's unacceptable, it's unethical, it's irresponsible. They are campaigning on the public dime. And my question, Mr. Speaker, is for once, will they do the right thing? Will the government cancel these partisan ads that are being paid for by taxpayers? It's not right. We already have one of the most Barry horrific debts in the world, and you're spending more to promote your own selfish partisan purposes. Oh. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is one province in this country that has a law in place that forbids partisan advertising, and that province is Ontario. Mr. Speaker. We are the only province that prohibits partisan advertising. 
advertising. So, Mr. Speaker, I say to the member opposite again, I understand he does not want people in the province to know about OHIP Plus, but we think it's important, Mr. Speaker. We think it's important that the four million children and young people in this province know that on January 1, 2018, that they will receive free medication. It's important to their families. It's important to them, Mr. Speaker. We Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. Finish, please. Rep. We think it's important, Mr. Speaker, to implement free tuition across the province. We think it's important to build hospitals in uh, Niagara, Windsor, Thank Hamilton, you. Markdale. The member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. And the Premier said that only one province Minister of the Environment. has a law to prevent partisan ads. Well, that was before this Premier. That was before this team completely eroded the powers of the Auditor General for their own partisan purpose. And right now we have the Auditor General saying these are partisan self-congratulatory vanity ads, and we have the government saying no, the Auditor General is in favour of them. Who do I trust? Do I trust this Liberal cabinet or do I trust the Auditor General? Mr. Speaker, I'm with the Auditor General. They are abusing taxpayers. They are abusing taxpayers to pay for their own partisan ads. You know what? Maybe it's because of the recent polls Minister they have to abuse taxpayers, affairs. promote themselves, but it's not right. They need to stop using taxpayers to sell their misguided agenda. No one in Ontario Question. thinks it's right to use taxpayer money for partisan ads. Do the right thing. Pull these ads. Thank you. You it, please? You it, please? Thank you. Yes. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, let me just remind the, uh, the member opposite that because facts still matter in Ontario, yeah. the legislation that bans partisan advertising is still in place in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, let me just pick up on something that the uh, leader of the opposition said. He talked about a misguided agenda. So what is he talking about? He's talking about OHIP plus pharmacare for young people from 0 to 25. He's talking about free tuition for young people from low-income families. He's talking about building hospitals and schools across this province. Thanks to both sides, we're now in warnings. The Minister of Children and Youth Services is warned. I'm going to get silence. Finish, please. He's talking about hydro relief across the province, Mr. Speaker. These are supports that people of this province need. We have the first balanced budget in nearly a decade, there Mr. Here. Speaker. We are going to make investments in the people of this province because the people Answer. of this province have earned that support. Yeah. 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 You see it, please. You see it, please. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Hydro rates have gone up 300 per cent under the Liberals and 50 per cent just under this Premier. People have good reason to be suspicious about any action that the Premier takes on the hydro file. And now, leaked documents, of course, show that hydro rates will be going up even further as a result of the Premier's scheme, causing even more skepticism about the Liberals' handling of our electricity system in this province. Will the Premier come clean with Ontarians on the future cost of hydro before her hydro scheme, her borrowing scheme, is voted on in this legislature. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to comment uh, in the supplementary, but let me just say that uh, we have been very clear, I have been very clear, the Minister of Energy has been very clear with the people of this province that. We have made investments in the electricity system in Ontario, $50 billion to make a reliable, clean, renewable electricity grid in Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek is warned. 
Carry on. It's clear that there was a cost associated with that, Mr. Speaker, and that that cost needs to be shared over the generations that are actually going to use that asset, Mr. Speaker. And so we are bringing forward a reduction of 25% on people's electricity bills to be in place by the summer, Mr. Speaker. And to do that, we are spreading the cost over a longer period of time. And that means that not just this generation today will pay for those costs, Answer. but that will be spread over a longer period of time. We've been very clear with the people of Ontario that that's what we're doing. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier's borrowing scheme will cause hydro rates to soar by over 50 per cent. She denies this, but she hasn't shown the people of Ontario any evidence to back up that denial. Will the public get any additional information on how much the Premier proposes to increase hydro costs after the next election so they can provide educated, informed feedback at the committee hearings next week? Speaker. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as uh, stated, we're bringing forward legislation that will actually reduce everyone's bills by uh, up to 25 percent on average, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's important that people know about this so they can understand that this government is acting to ensure that we're making our system as affordable as can be, Mr. Speaker, for many of these families. 800,000 families that live in the rural and um, northern parts of our province, Mr. Speaker they'll see a 40 to 50 percent reduction. And that's what we're doing right now, Mr. Speaker, in the short term. In the medium term, Mr. Speaker, we're ensuring that we're holding the rates to the cost of inflation. And then for the long term, Mr. Speaker, the 2017 long term energy plan will project where costs are going to be so people can see the transparent process that we have because we rebuilt a system, one that is coal free, that is clean, that Thank is you. reliable. And Something now, Mr. Speaker. Hey, Speaker, the Premier and her Liberal government have made a mess of our hydro system, and it has cost Ontario families and businesses far too much. And they think it's funny, but it isn't funny when people have to make choices about paying their hydro bill or putting food on the table, or choices about keeping people employed or paying their businesses' electricity bill. From the gas plant scandal to the broken promises not to sell off Hydro One to the four years four years of denying that there was any problem at all with people's rising hydro bills. Why has this Premier had so much trouble reconciling what she says with what she does? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In terms of reconciliation, when it comes to talking, Mr. Speaker, and then acting, it's this Premier that actually committed this government to bringing forward the Fair Hydro Plan, and that's reducing everybody's bills across this province, Mr. Speaker, by 25 per cent. If you look, Mr. Speaker, at a, at a plan that has no reconciliation and no idea on how it would ever achieve a number, it's the, pla the pamphlet that the NDP put together, Mr. Speaker. There is absolutely no way that they're going to take off one cent, not a single cent, off of anyone's bills. And let alone, Mr. Speaker, they don't even talk about helping low-income individuals until the last page in one line. Mr. Speaker, part of our, a large part of our plan is helping our low-income individuals, Answer. our seniors, our on-reserve First Nations peoples that they don't even mention in their plan, Mr. Speaker. This is a plan that will work for every Ontario. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier. Look, leaked documents show very clearly that the Premier knows her $40 billion borrowing scheme is going to end up costing families and businesses on their already sky-high hydro bills. But she denies that her plan is based on these documents. Well, if the leaked information is inaccurate, Speaker, why won't the Premier just come clean and release the information that did inform her plan? <laughs> So again, Mr. Speaker, let me just uh, reinforce uh, what I have said in this House uh, in uh, uh, previous days, Mr. Speaker. Um, there is a short-term, a mid-term, and a long-term plan around electricity prices. We know that people need relief now, Mr. Speaker. That's what the 25% on average reduction uh, for all Ontarians is, Mr. Speaker, and it will be in place by the summer. Um, we will then hold those 
uh, the rate of uh, increase of electricity bills down for four years, Mr. Speaker, to the uh, level of inflation. And then, Mr. Speaker, the long-term energy plan, which is being developed right now, will give businesses and families around the province a snapshot of just that, the long-term uh, energy plan, Mr. Speaker. But we will continue over the medium and the long term to continue to take costs out of the system, which has happened Answer. with each one of our long-term energy plans, Mr. Speaker. We found ways to take costs out. That will continue, and uh, the people of the province, when that plan is ready, they will see it, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what the Premier uh, neglected to say is that after four years, those bills are going to soar in Ontario by over, 40, by over 50 per cent. Leaked documents show that the hydro bills will absolutely go up. Yet the Premier's answer to this disgusting betrayal of Ontario families and businesses is just, just trust me, just trust me, it's going to all be fine. Yeah, well, well, Ontarians are getting pretty fed up with the Just Trust Me line, Speaker. It's what the Premier said before she broke her promise to not to sell off Hydro One. And it's what she said about the Sudbury bribery charges right before a criminal investigation got underway. Just Trust Me is not good enough for the people of Ontario. When will this Premier release the information she says is showing the long-term effects of her borrowing scheme so that Ontarians have all the Question. facts before she rams this legislation through the House? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let's be clear. We have. We're from Kitchener Waterloo is warned. So, as I was saying, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. The fact is, 25 percent is coming off of everybody's bills, Mr. Speaker, before summer, once this legislation passes. 40 50 per cent is coming off 800,000 families' bills, Mr. Speaker, in northern and in rural parts of our province. That's a significant savings for these families, Mr. Speaker. We're also helping small businesses and farms. When you want to continue to talk about facts, Mr. Speaker, it is this government that acted, that cleaned up the mess left by the opposition parties when they were in power and the system that they left for us to clean up. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. And I do not appreciate gestures being made by members. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, our plan has been praised by poverty advocates, by Indigenous leaders, by business leaders, and by energy experts, Mr. Speaker. Francesca Dobbin, the Executive Director of the United Way of Bruce Gray, says this government is listening Sir. to the people. With uh, positive changes, our rural community will now truly benefit from the low-cost power it produces, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Speaker, clarity is actually what the people of this province need and deserve, but they're not getting any of it from their government. The Premier's scheme punishes families who are already struggling with their electricity bills. She is rushing through the House, shutting down debate. Any chance of meaningful public input is being truncated by this government. And she claims that the leaked documents that came to light last week um, about the plan are inaccurate, but she refuses to come clean with the people of the province about the facts. Why is this Premier going to such great lengths, Speaker? to make sure that the people don't have all the information about a plan that will affect their lives for three decades or more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, we have short-term solutions, medium-term solution, and a long-term solution, Mr. Speaker. 25 per cent off with all of the other programs that are coming out, Mr. Speaker, through the Fair Hydro Plan is something that all families will see. Right before summer, Mr. Speaker, we hope to have that passed and get it into their pockets, Mr. Speaker, as soon as possible. In the medium term, we are holding rates to the cost of inflation for the next four years. And then when it comes to the long term, Mr. Speaker, we are the only party that actually can plan long term. These parties opposite have no idea. One of them doesn't even have a plan, Mr. Speaker. They have no idea on what to do when it comes to electricity. We're making sure, Mr. Speaker, that we're bringing forward reductions that will help families all at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we cleaned up a system, 
We've made sure it's clean, it's reliable, and it is something, Mr. Speaker, we should all be proud of Answer. because people look to us to see what they can do to emulate our system, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Your question? A member from Halliburton, Cork and Ice Club. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Yesterday, the Attorney General suggested that the Ontario Justice Council's new education plan would mandate sexual assault law training for Ontario judges. That would be great news. I've been calling on this kind of training for weeks and even tabled a private member's bill about it. The problem is that this new training plan does not mandate sexual assault law training. The training, quote, encourages new judges to attend seminars, one of which is about sexual assault law. Mr. Speaker, this is not a solution. So my question to the Attorney General is, how can the minister suggest that this issue has been resolved when what we really have is a continuation of the status quo? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. First of all, I want to thank the, the member opposite and the member from, from Devonport uh, uh, for their advocacy on this very important uh, issue. Speaker, uh, I've spoken on this issue uh, numerous times, and, and I've always advised all members of this, of this House that at all times uh, we have to respect the independence of our judiciary when it comes to matters around what training they should receive. It's a decision of the judiciary. Therefore, Speaker, on behalf of this House and behalf of our Premier and the government, I've, I've also have written to the Chief Justice of the Ontario Court of Justice and had the chance to spoken to her. She has informed me, Speaker, uh, uh, through correspondence, uh, that uh, she has uh, now uh, uh, expressly uh, mandate, uh, has mandated sexual assault training for all new judges. She has informed me, Speaker, that uh, changes have been made to the education plan that is available um, online. I, I commend uh, the Chief Justice for taking this very important step. It is within her purview to make those decisions, and I'm happy Thank to you. know that that express mandate is now. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, yesterday's Toronto Star article by Christian Rishawi quotes the Ontario Judicial, Judicial Council as saying that under the changes, the legal and social context issues around sexual assault are integrated into various programs, but they are only for new judges. And I believe in the article and, and by the OCJ that it's not even mandatory. So uh, I, I wonder, is the minister really satisfied with his answer? Uh, it clearly doesn't meet the expectations for survivors of sexual assault who want to be sure that the court system will treat their cases fairly. I do know that the minister cares about this issue. So my question to him, Will he finally agree that mandated sexual assault training needs to be legislated? And will he support my bill? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker, again, I, I thank the member opposite. I thank the member from Devonport and, and, and the Premier and, and, and all members of the House for, uh, for uh, their work on this very important issue, and we should never, ever undermine uh, uh, sexual uh, assault, uh, violence against women or harassment in any shape whatsoever. Uh, speaker, my responsibility as the Attorney General is, is always to work with our, our, with our courts, with, our, with the judiciary, which are independent. I am sure all members will appreciate at no point ever we want to uh, cross the line and interfere in the, the affairs of the judiciary because their independence uh, is key. Uh, my obligation on behalf of this House and all members is, is, is to do that work, uh, and I have been doing that work, and I have been informed by the Chief Justice uh, that uh, the education plan yes, for ju uh, judiciary has been updated and now expressly mandates uh, training for new judges. I think that's, uh, that's a good step direction. I am confident that Thank more you. can be done, and we'll continue to work on that. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelville. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Premier. Ontario is in the midst of an opioid crisis that demands urgent action. People are losing their lives every day on the street of this city. In fact, 258 people died from a drug overdose in Toronto in 2015, and that number continues to climb. On March 20th, two months ago, the Toronto Board of Health requested additional funding of $375,000 from this government to support the Toronto Overdose Action Plan, but this government has so far refused to provide the additional funding that's needed. In the midst of a growing crisis of overdose death, when everyone recognizes that the urgent action is desperately needed, why has this government failed to provide the resources that Toronto needs to help save lives? Question, thank you. So, um, 
Mr. Speaker, I, I really appreciate the question from, uh, from the member opposite. This is, this is an in incredibly serious issue that, uh, that is being dealt with across the country, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, our, uh, our Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has taken a leadership role uh, with his colleague ministers across the, prov uh, across the country, Mr. Speaker. We have an opioid strategy in place. We are gathering data that now the federal government is uh, coming on board, and they are, uh, they are uh, putting in place a strategy that will give us better information and will mean that we'll be able to track what is uh, going on in the, in the country and thereby be able to prevent and uh, provide better treatment. On the Toronto-specific issue, Mr. Speaker, I am aware of the request made by the City of Toronto uh, regarding funding towards the Toronto Overdose Action Plan. Um, we've received their submission. It's being reviewed. Um, we're, uh, I, I want the member to know that uh, we Answer. are hosting um, meeting of mayors, and I will say more in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. We are in the midst of a public health crisis, a crisis that is growing here in Toronto and right across our province. When local boards of health comes to the Premier to set up and provide additional support to directly save lives, this government should be ready to help, I would say, in a heartbeat. That's what urgent action means. That's the proper response to a growing crisis. That's what a crisis demands. How much longer will Toronto have to wait to get the resources to save lives and stop the overdose crisis in this city? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite knows that we are there. Um, we are supporting uh, three proposed safe injection sites in the City of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. That was uh, something that the City of Toronto had asked for. The uh, Mayor of Ottawa was here, Mr. Speaker, a number of weeks ago. I met with him. Uh, he brought forward a plan. I, I said that we would support that plan, Mr. Speaker. And out of that meeting with the Mayor— member from the P.N. Carleton is warned. With the Mayor of Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, came uh, uh, a meeting that we are hosting for all of the uh, mayors who, uh, who want to be involved. Mr. Speaker, this is not just an issue that is relevant in Toronto or Ottawa. It's actually a, an issue that's relevant in many urban centres and in small towns. Mr. Speaker, this is across the province that we need to uh, we need to make sure we're doing the right thing, and we will be working with our municipalities, as we already are, to see what further needs to be done. Okay. New question, the member from. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. As we prepare to celebrate the Victoria Day long weekend, it is a good time to reflect on a region that is one of the most extraordinary places on the planet. It's blessed with abundant fresh water, significant natural features like the Oak Ridges Moraine and Niagara Escarpment, excellent farmland, and a moderate, though sometimes unpredictable, climate. These assets support a high quality of life and economic opportunities. They help make the GGH's dynamic economy Canada's largest economic engine. That is fueled by a diverse and talented population. Today, our government released updated land use plans for the region that will protect our natural resources and support future prosperity. Would the minister please provide some details on today's announcement? Question. Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, the member is correct. Today, our government released four updated land use plans that will help grow the greater Golden Horseshoe. The region is a success story and attracts people from all over the country and around the world. Already home to 9.5 million people, the Greater Golden Horseshoe is forecasted to grow by approximately 50 per cent over the next 25 years. The Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Greenbelt Plan, the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan, and the Niagara Escarpment Plan set out an overarching strategy of where and how future growth should be accommodated and what we need to protect for current and future generations. The updates will help us achieve a more efficient use of land, resources and infrastructure so that we can reduce sprawl, ensure the region is growing in a way that protects our vital assets and building communities that are vibrant, they're healthy and they're prosperous. Speaker, the updates are the result of a significant amount yes, of work and extensive consultation, which I will speak about more in the supplementary. Wow. supplementary. 
Thanks to the minister for his answer, and I was particularly happy to hear our government's commitment to uh, reaffirm commitment to protecting the green belt, as were the many uh, dozens, perhaps if not hundreds, of constituents in my riding of Davenport who called, wrote, and visited my office to express their support. Our government established the green belt in 2005. I understand that we are now growing the green belt to include 21 new urban river valleys and associated wetlands. Plus five new parcels of land. We've also extended greenbelt like protections for natural heritage, water, and agriculture to the entire Greater Golden Horseshoe area. This will help protect sensitive lands for generations to come without constraining development. I appreciate the work that has gone in, into these changes. Question. I understand many people provided input. Would the minister elaborate on the consultation process that leap up, le Thank led you. up to today's announcement? Speaker, again, thank you to the member. We're happy as a government to reaffirm our commitment to the Green Belt and the principles it was founded on. This process began in February of 2015. The first stage saw the establishment of an expert panel headed by the Honourable David Crombie. And I want to give David my heartfelt thanks for his leadership and to recognize panel members for their recommendations. Throughout the process, which included a six-month consultation period in 2016 and a number of meetings with municipal leaders, we heard unanimous support for the goals of these plans. One size doesn't fit all was something we also heard a great deal about during the consultation, and we've taken that into account in the final revisions to the plan. They provide greater flexibility that recognizes local circumstances without compromising the objectives of the plans. These new land use plans set the foundations for a sustainable, healthy, vibrant, and prosperous Greater Golden Horseshoe. They've been shaped by thousands of Answer. people across the province through a lot of very hard work, Speaker, and I would like to thank all of them today, including my staff, who have worked very hard on this over the course of the last 12 months. Thank you very much. The question, the member from Kitchener, yes, uh, Thomas My question to the Minister of uh, Transportation. Speaker, $1 million can go a long way here in the province. It could help children with special needs or people struggling to pay their hydro bills. But instead of helping those in Ontario who need it the most, the government has decided to use $1 million of taxpayer money to open up an electric vehicle car shop. Minister Murray called this absurd waste of taxpayers' money the first of its kind. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell us if this taxpayer-funded vanity project will be also the last of its kind? Is there going to be a drive? Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Very happy to take the question from the member. Uh, this member, who's uh, served in this legislature for a number of years, would know uh, that over the last number of years there have been a number of initiatives that our government has brought forward with respect to supporting consumers uh, who tell us loudly and clearly, Speaker, that they want to do their part uh, in the, uh, the very crucial fight against climate change. Speaker, we know here in the province of Ontario that roughly 35 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions flow uh, as a result of activities within the transportation sector, and a large share of those, Speaker, uh, come as a result of people who are driving vehicles that have traditional internal combustion engines. That's why, over the last number of years, we have brought forward a number of initiatives, including the Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, Speaker, including uh, support for the expansion of a significant build-out of a charging infrastructure network in every corner of the province of Ontario because we want to help enable the kinds of choices that consumers tell us they want to make in order to do their part Thank you. with respect to that fight against climate change. Speaker. Supplementary. Yes, thanks, Speaker. You know, Speaker, this government refuses to fund life-changing treatments for rare disease patients while these ministers hand out 14 grand rebates to luxury electric Tesla owners and waste a million priorities. dollars on electric priorities, car lots. Priorities. Now, in the real world, if someone wants to open a car lot, they use their own money. But when the ministers of Transportation and Environment unveiled Stephen Glenn's electric car shop yesterday, they used a million dollars of taxpayer money on their government-funded vanity project. They can call it a discovery center, an education center. They can use whatever liberal spin they choose. But when it comes down to it, the liberals just wasted one million taxpayer dollars I building an electric car dealership. Are you guys working on Mr. Speaker, will the ministers be working weekends at the car dealership <laughs> to pay back this wasteful spending? <laughs> to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I just want to point out 
that we are in a strategic partnership with all the major auto manufacturers and global. Every single vehicle, electric vehicle made in Ontario and sold in Ontario has been donated to be part of this. The car dealers know that member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Could have warned him earlier when he was heckling during his own per member's question. <laughs> Carry on. Car dealers know this centre is absolutely essential to advance EV sales and the development of them. Every major auto manufacturer. But, Mr. Speaker, it does not surprise us over here that the party that voted— I'll do it. member from Renfrew and Nipissing, Pembroke, is warned. Carry on. Voted against every investment we made in the auto sector that would have seen the collapse of our auto sector and loss of jobs doesn't support them. The party that doesn't support $200 million, the biggest investment in EV mobility, to, to develop autonomous and electric Thank vehicles you. here, didn't support that. And the party Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Nurses are leaders in our health care system, and I want to welcome registered nurses uh, that are here today from ONA. Every day, every day, nurses are on the front lines as first responders in our emergency rooms and throughout our health care system. Nurses see and experience trauma in their workplaces each and every day, whether it's patients in life-threatening conditions or the violence that put health, puts health care workers uh, themselves at risk. New Democrats believe that all nurses in Ontario need to be covered by presumptive PTSD legislation. Why doesn't the Premier agree? Minister of Labour. Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the leader of the third party for that excellent question. Because certainly, I think uh, if there's an issue that we have come along a far way along in the past year, Speaker, it's on PTSD coverage for our first responders. Mm -hmm. Speaker, we all came together as three parties in this house to support a bill that was passed about a year ago, Speaker, and each one of us had some input into that. Each one of us chose at that point in time which people should be covered under that bill, Speaker. As we move on, obviously, Speaker, questions are being asked that should some other people be included in that, Speaker. And at this point in time, Speaker, we should be proud of what we've done as a government, Speaker. Look to the future as what potentially we could do, Speaker, because Post-traumatic stress disorder amongst our first responders is something we've ignored for far too long. We have a piece of legislation in place now, Speaker. Legislation can always be improved upon, but we're in a leadership role in the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, during the committee process of the bill that the minister is talking about, we brought the amendments to include nurses and others. But the Liberal government refused to include nurses in the legislation at that time. So, in fact, we could have legislation right now that does cover nurses, but the Liberals decided not to do that, Speaker. At a time when nurses are dealing with violence in the workplace, overcrowding in hospital hallways, increasing workloads, and the physical and psychological demands, Speaker, that come from this government's cuts to hospitals, the Premier has chosen to turn her back on these nurses and deny them WSIB coverage that every first responder needs and deserves. Why is this Premier and her government refusing to do the right thing, stand up for Question. nurses, and extend PTSD legislation to every nurse in Ontario? Thank you. Speaker, I don't believe for a minute that anybody's turned their back on anybody in this process. Exactly. This has been one of the best processes that this House has ever undertaken in taking an issue that was ignored. You had people, Speaker, there was tragic outcomes to some of the things that were happening at that point in time, Speaker. You had our first responders as a result of not being able to get coverage, Speaker, presumptive coverage under WSIB, with choosing to take their own lives, Speaker. We knew we needed to do something about that. Speaker, we bought Bill 109 in, as I think it was, Speaker, PTSD or 160, Speaker. And, Speaker, we've made a huge step forward. We're always open to discussion, Speaker, because nurses we know play such a huge integral role in the provision of services to our society, Speaker. I think the member from Welland has to be warned. 
Carry on. Speaker, in a first responder role, nurses are covered Answer. in our correction institution, Speaker. We've, de we've come a long way. Perhaps we have more to do, Speaker, but Thank we you. should be proud of what we've done. Thank you. New question. The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Yeah, question to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Mr. Minister, as you know, in the recent months, our farmers and agri-food sector has come under vicious attack from uh, our American neighbours. And uh, to many uh, people in Ontario, we know full well that uh, our agri-food industry is a $36 billion industry, wow. and it employs 800,000 people. And we create and they create clean, safe, quality food in Ontario every day. Our dairy farmers, our milk farmers, yet we're being told that we have to abandon our successful supply management system. I know you're going to Wisconsin Question. to meet with the Great Lakes representatives to tell them about our strong agricultural system in Ontario and that we're Thank not you. going to be bullied by those. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the question from my colleague, uh, the member from Eglinton Lawrence, uh, this morning. But I want to recognize him. He was the unsung hero that helped to bring back French's ketchup production in the province of Ontario. The member sat down. The member sat down. A supplementary. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> anyways, uh, when you are going on this trade mission uh, to uh, talk about the importance of our supply management system in Ontario, and the fact is that uh, we have a surplus. In other words, the Americans get more out of trade with Ontario and agri-food than what we get back, yet they want us to scrap this incredibly good system. Great so I ask you, Minister, what are you going to tell our American neighbours about our great agri-food industry and our great farmers and our great supply management system, which is second to none in the world when it comes to producing good, safe, quality food? Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the supplementary. Basically, what we have here today is the problem with milk production is in the United States. We have oversupply in places like Wisconsin, New York, Illinois, Pennsylvania. I'll be uh, going to Wisconsin next week to tell my colleagues down there that Ontario is not to prepared to see what it when it comes to our supply managed system. Good the best you. system that's ever been designed for agriculture, yes. fair price to consumer, fair price to, to uh, our producers of province of Ontario, and we won't let the Americans it. attack yes. a very successful system that contributes more than 22 percent to Ontario's agri-food sector, 23 percent of their sector's job, and I'm asking all members on all sides to stand up for Ontario's supply managed system. Hey, 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 hey. Can you see it, please? Thank you. Your question, the member from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, today is for the Premier. On March 24th, the MPP from Northumberland, Quinty West, will be in Thedford, in the municipality of Lampton Shores, in my riding, for a public meeting about the government's plan to close more rural schools. Curiously, the invitation sent by the issues management team at the Ministry of Education specifies that, and I quote, photography and video recording does not occur once the engagement session begins, unquote. Speaker, Heather Wright, publisher of the Petrolia Independent, calls it a shameful excuse to limit press freedom and a trampling over the very basic freedoms of the press. Speaker, the Premier's plans to fast track the closure of more rural schools is not only an important issue in my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, but all across the province. Will the Premier direct the Ministry of Question. Education to lift the media blackout on this so-called public meeting, or will the government continue to close more rural schools under a veil of secrecy? Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Education is going to want to uh, speak to the supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, um, over my years as a, as a parent and as a member of a school council, Mr. Speaker, and as a school trustee um, and as a, a community member, Mr. Speaker, I've been to more. Uh, education consultations than I can count, Mr. Speaker. And what I know is that at those meetings, there are people who want to be on the public record and who want to speak out, and then there are people who want to talk about an issue but actually don't want it to become a, uh, a public discussion. And what we need at, uh, at a meeting like the one that's happening around uh, the, the rural schools and community schools is we need everybody to to feel free to speak, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the Minister of Education will always speak to, uh, to the media. There will always be opportunities for the media to know what the discussion is about. But, Mr. Speaker, people need to be able to thank speak you. freely. Supplementary, the member from Sarnia, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. In the email exchange between the spokesperson for the Ministry of Education, Heather Wright, of the Petroleum Independent, the minister's spokesperson spins the need for media blackout by citing, quote, consent concerns of the participants, end of quote. But how does the ministry already know there are consent concerns at a public meeting that's still a week away? So far, the only confirmed attendee is the member for Northumberland, Quinty West. Is it possible that your own government is concerned about there being a video recording of this meeting? Premier, there are already many concerns that this listening tour is much ado about nothing. Premier, journalists have an important role to play in our democracy. Will you lift this blackout today so Ms. Wright and other journalists can do their job as professional journalists? Here, here. Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to um, thank the members for the question. It's a great opportunity to talk about these engagements and the fact that we're going into 10 communities across rural and northern Ontario to talk about how we improve education for students. And that's what we're there to do, Mr. Speaker. Um, my colleagues uh, that have been doing these consultations along with me, great we've work. engaged with the media. Media have attended as the sessions were, were beginning, and, uh, and there's a process for the media to be involved in these consultations, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, and as the Premier has already said, we want to have a really robust conversation with, uh, with parents, with students, with school boards, with municipalities, with everyone who is engaged in this very important dialogue on, around how we can Correct. improve our schools in rural and northern communities. And we want to ensure that we create Answer. the space for them to do that. And we have a process for connecting with the media that is quite open and transparent, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Joshua Ferguson is a queer, non-binary person who has applied to change the sex designation on their birth certificate. Currently in Ontario, one cannot amend their birth registration of birth to anything other than male or female categories. Ontarians should have the right to have their birth certificates accurately reflect the correct sex designation. Will the minister issue an amended birth certificate to Joshua and others like them that correctly reflect their sex designation. Thank you, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Parkdale High Park for this very important question because I have been following Joshua's story with great interest. Joshua presented at a Service Ontario uh, office recently. And I want to say off the top, of course, that our government uh, values acceptance, respect, and diversity. And we're very committed to ensuring that all Ontarians are treated ethically, equitably, fairly, including the trans and non-binary community. It's important to note, of course, that Ontario has already changed the way it displays information about a person's sex on health cards and driver's license, making it easier for people to have documents that align with their gender identity. We've also recently introduced a policy to help the trans and non-binary community uh, to live according to their gender Answer. identity. There's new rules 
and I'll talk more in the supplementary about what we're going to do on the birth certificate side. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the minister. It's difficult to get a health card or a driver's license if you can't get a birth certificate. Ontario passed Toby's Law in 2012, adding gender identity and gender expression to the Human Rights Code. Applying for a birth certificate with non-binary designation is entirely legal under Toby's Law. But sadly, Joshua may not be afforded rights. This should not be an issue. Trans and non-binary rights are human rights. Why is the government breaking its own law? Minister. Again, I want to thank the member for the question. And similar to the driver's license and health card uh, uh, examples I mentioned, I'm very pleased to report to the Legislature that the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services is developing a gender-neutral option for Ontario birth certificates. We know a birth certificate is a foundation for many forms of identification, and we need to sure, ensure we get that right. We need to work with uh, the federal government and other ministries, of course, on this. Uh, there was a recent consultation held with the trans and non-binary community on the development of an OPS-wide policy, and that is going to help inform our work on this birth certificate issue. I attended that session. Speaker, I was deeply moved uh, from the conversations I had with a number of attendees. It's my hope that we will target further yes, consultations with the key partners I mentioned and get moving on this this summer. Thank, Thank you. you. Any question, the member from Barrie? Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. Nuclear energy is a vital part of Ontario's energy mix and economy. Our province is at the centre of nuclear energy advancements and technology, and that's something of which all the members of this House can be proud. Our nuclear facilities power more than half of Ontario and help us get rid of dirty coal. Here, here. When it comes to nuclear energy, public safety is of very high importance. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister update the House on the recently announced changes to the Provincial Nuclear Emergency Response Plan? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to thank the MPP from Barrie for this question. Minister, is the safety and the security of every Ontarian, and we are updating our Provincial Nuclear Emergency Response Plan this year to ensure that it reflects the most current technologies and facilities so that we can keep Ontarians safe in the highly unlikely event of a nuclear accident. We are taking lessons learned from past nuclear emergencies, such as the Fukushima accidents, to ensure Ontario remains a global leader in nuclear safety. The proposed change to the PNERP are now available for public comments for the first time, Mr. Speaker, and it is crucial that everyone, affected Answer. groups and everyone, comments, including the general public. I encourage everyone, all interested, to comment on this Thank important you. issue. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the minister for her response. I'm confident in Ontario's safety record and our emergency plan. I know that the minister has been working hard to ensure that this plan is fully up to date and reflects all best practices. Here, here. Can the minister further speak to the provincial nuclear energy response plan? Good. Thank you. Minister? Um, again, I want to say thank you to, to the member for questions. And, and I want to assure the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we're fully prepared should the highly unlikely event of a nuclear emergency occur. And Mr. Speaker, nuclear power has been meeting Ontario's energy needs safely for over 40 years, and our government is proud of that excellent and proven record. It helps us achieve our environmental goals and brings tens of thousands of jobs to Ontario. Once we receive our public input on our updated plan, our newly established experts uh, advisory committee made up of top nuclear experts from around the world, national and international, will provide recommendations based on the feedback that we are receiving. 
And Mr. Speaker, Answer. I am proud that the public is participating in this process for the very first time, as well as everyone is commenting. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The question, the member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. From the Sunshine List, we saw the release of the salary and benefits of the CEO for the Central West CCAC. Her benefits for last year were almost $20,000, up an incredible 1,000 per cent. The Auditor General has already reported that 39 cents of every dollar spent at our CCACs go to administration, not frontline services. How can the Premier justify this massive increase in the CEO's compensation? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, the, the member opposite knows that uh, we have put in place salary caps, a range of, uh, of caps, Mr. Speaker. Uh, she also knows that where there are situations where the, the comparators that have been used, and I, and I don't know the, uh, the, uh, the details of this specific situation. I'm sure the, mem the President of the Treasury Board will be able to speak to it in the supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that where the comparators that have been used are not uh, reasonable, then we will uh, we will push back on that and uh, ask for a review of those. But, Mr. Speaker, we have put those caps in place for very good reason, and those ranges need to be respected, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. But clearly, the caps aren't working. Back to the Premier. After the Auditor General's scathing report, the Minister of Health wrote a letter to all CCC, CCACs telling them, and I quote, not to enhance compensation or entitlements for non-union and management staff in any way, including wages, benefits, bonuses, and termination provisions. Clearly, the CCAC in Central West ignored the minister's direction. When will the premier put an end to these unacceptable raises in executive compensations? Thank you. President of the Treasury Board. Premier, President of the Treasury Board. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I think what, what we're, I can't comment on the per particular individual. I can't comment on member from Dufferin Calendon is warned. I can't comment on that particular individual salary and what, what has happened in the particular circumstance, but what I can do is talk about the process that we are currently undergoing, which is we've asked our broader public sector partners uh, to uh, look at comparators that our public sector that are Canadian, that are comparable, that take into consideration the geography, the scope of responsibilities that people have, and to not pay more than the midpoint of reasonable comparators. I can tell you that that man has not yet We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 132, an act to enact the Fair Hydro Plan, the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan Act 2017, and to make amendments to the Electricity Act 1998 and the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
all members, please take your seats. On May 15, 2017, Mr. Thibault moves second reading of Bill 132. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Naki. Mr. Naki. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Domerla. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Madame Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by your clerk. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barry. Mr. Barry. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantai. Mr. Vantai. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Madame Jelena. Ms. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Uh, Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 52, the nays are 38. The ayes being 52 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, do you have an the law? Pursuant to the order of the House dated May, 13, uh, May 17, 2017, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. We have another deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 96, an act to enact the Human Trafficking Awareness Day Act 2017 and the Prevention of and Remedies of Human Trafficking Act 2017. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill. On May 17, 2017, Ms. Nadu Harris moved their third reading of Bill 96, an act to enact the Human Trafficking Awareness Day Act 2017 and the Prevention of and Remedies for Human Trafficking Act 2017. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Nackie. Mr. Nackie. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mrs. Sandler. Mrs. Sandler. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. 
Kratz, Mr. Kratz, Ms. Domerle, Ms. Domerle, Ms. McGarry, Ms. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Ms. Albanese, Ms. Albanese, Ms. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Ms. Renil, Ms. Renil, Madame De Rosier, Madame De Rosier. Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott, Mr. Arnold, Mr. Arnold, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Mr. Cloud, Mr. Cloud, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Yakubuski, Mr. Yakubuski, Mr. McNaughton, Mr. McNaughton, Ms. Thompson, Ms. Thompson, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, Mrs. Monroe, Mrs. Monroe, Mr. Urich, Mr. Urich, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Osterhoff, Mr. Osterhoff, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Mrs. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Coe, Mr. Coe, Mr. Cho, Mr. Cho. Ms. Sattler, Ms. Ms. Horvath, Ms. Horvath, Ms. Shubisong, Ms. Shubisong, Mr. Vanikoff, Mr. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek, Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Taylor, Madame Jelena, Madame Jelena, Ms. Fife, Ms. Fife, Ms. Forrester, Ms. Forrester, Mr. Hatfield, Mr. Hatfield, Mrs. Gretzky, Mrs. Gretzky, Mr. Gates, Mr. Gates, Ms. French, Ms. French. As opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 90, the nays are zero. The ayes being 90 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have another deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 124, an act to amend Residential Tendencies Act 2006. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell. Earlier today, Mr. Nack, we moved third reading of Bill 124, an act to amend the Residential Tenancy Acts of 2006. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Duguid, Mr. Duguid, Ms. McCharles, Mr. Charles, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlo. Mr. Domerlo. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Renil. Mr. Renil. Madame De Rosier. Madame De Rosier. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Cloud. Mr. Cloud. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanthoff. Mr. Vanthoff. Mr. Mill. Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk.
The ayes are 88, the nays are zero. The ayes being 88 and the nays being zero, I declare, declare the motion carried. Through reading of the bill, twice election due project de loi. Resolved that the bill do not pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.